over to Lyman and Anita. Um, I'm going to start, uh, many of you know me, but for those who don't, my name is Susanna Gellert. I'm the Executive Artistic Director here at Weston Theatre Company, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all here uh, to this nice, cool, wonderful room this afternoon. I'm now going to turn to my notes because I have some important things I want to talk about, and I don't want to forget anything. Um, so, uh, I'm going to start by just saying, most importantly, that we are so grateful to Lyman and Anita for joining us this evening. As many of you know, Lyman was raised in Weston and grew up just down the road in a house on the Village Green. I hardly need to go into his life's work at the Vermont Country Store. Lyman's love for the art of Vermont has spanned over four decades and continues to this day. He has assembled over 200 works of Vermont art, all created by, by Vermont artists and by artists who loved Vermont. The Lyman Orton Collection today is the largest collection of 20th century art depicting Vermont's landscape, its people, and their way of life. Anita Raphael is a writer living and writing in Wardsboro, Vermont, in an 1840s carriage barn that she rehabbed herself. Her articles about people, places, arts, food, travel, and events in Vermont have appeared in magazines and newspapers throughout the state since 2007. These include Edible Vermont, Vermont Country Magazine, Vermont Arts Living, and Okemo Valley Magazine, to name just a few. Before relocating to Vermont from Newport, Rhode Island, Anita co collaborated with the Rhode Island Historical Society, the Blackstone Valley Tourism Council, and the National Park Service to write interpretive materials and travel literature, and to create heritage-themed uh, museum programming in the Blackstone River Valley National Historic Park. She has been a popular public speaker on local history and cultural heritage topics since the mid-1990s. In addition, she crafts in a variety of fine fiber arts and also draws and paints. She is the daughter and granddaughter of artists. Lyman and Anita will speak about his wonderful art collection and the book he and Anita have written about it. Before we begin, I also want to extend special thank you to our partners tonight, the Weston Historical Society, the London Dairy Arts and Historical Society, and the Manchester Historical Society. And please join us following the presentation for a reception in the lobby, where curator Donnell Barnum will have signed copies of the book for purchase. Some of you might have seen them on your way in. Uh, and so, without further ado, please uh, welcome Lyman Orton and Anita Raphael. Well, thanks so much, and I'm really sad that we're getting all this cell service in Weston. You know, we had a block for two months, walking around the country store looking up what it costs on Amazon. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Jen. I'd like to start by introducing Danelle Barnum and recognizing her. Danelle has been the curator of this collection for as long as she's been at the country store, which is 30 something years. And so it's it's because of Danelle that it's all organized, it's all ready to go, it's um, she knows what is what, where is where, and if she doesn't, she can look it up on the inventory of the computer system that I can't begin to operate. So Danelle, you've done a great job and I thank you so much and please stand up. This isn't a piece of art. Well, it sure is. Um, but it's a, a, a little warm up here. So this is Calvin Walker and yours truly in 1948. And my father did a story for Vermont Life on Ken Walker and the family. And so they got this one of me and Calvin. I'm holding the pail. And, um, feet in calf and went into Vermont life that year. And here we are on the Walker Farm, and it was right over there in the barn where the picture was taken. So I thought I'd start out with, with that one just for old memory's sake for myself and for any of you, many of you who knew the Walkers. Now here's a... Oh, back one. Yeah, yeah, all right. Another photograph. Does, does anybody know, recognize that? What is that? What was it? Yes. And what was going on there? Skin. That was the rope toe on Morgan Hill, which is across 
the river from the country store if you look straight over that's Morgan Hill. And it's all grown up now, but that shack on the lower left held the motor, the old Model A en uh, engine that made the road go, and the three little sticks up there are, are telephone poles holding the rope and so forth, and you come all the way to the top of the mountain and then you ski down. So it's all grown out now, but that's where we all learned to ski. And I was with the kids, and I could just put the skis on my house and ski over. So that was great. Here's another shot of me on the left of the rope tow with somebody about to get on. And I always thought that was Lummy Lumber, but I'm not sure. At the top, we had two jumps there as well. And so we all jumped, and he was, he's getting ready there. He has no holes to jump. And then, of course, we've got on the left my parents and me and my brother Jeremy getting ready to go see him that day. And then my mother on the right, Mildred, standing by the road pedal. And hers was in the late 30s. This other one was in the, oh, 1948 or 49, something like that. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to tell us a story about how his mother used to patch his woolen jacket where the rope toe frayed it. And so he ended up over the years with a snow jacket full of patches. And it was wool. It was warm. And so she uh, used to patch it. We managed to get that story in the book. And it's just another shot of Morgan Hill uh, back in the day and how clear it was because it was all pasture land. That's your dad. And that's what, well, yeah, one of the, my father on the right, I don't know who the other guy is. So, and I would also, by the way, go back to the library in the background, as it is today. But the playhouse is gone, and as you all know, Dan is terrible by the flood and then torn down, and that's going to be part of where the um, new library expansion is going to go, more or less. My turn. <laughs> So to tell the story of the artists who came particularly to this area, uh, Southern Vermont, is to understand why they came here in the first place. And they came here in the early part of the 1900s mainly because this was the farthest, cheapest, easiest place you could get to in one short train ride out of New York City. You could leave uh, uh, Manhattan, uh, hop on the train, come up the Hudson River, on the railroad tracks, cut across through Bennington, and come to uh, this area. So a lot of artists didn't go any farther north. And a lot of there's a story about why they didn't go any farther north, uh, because of what they found here, in addition to the scenic beauty. Well, they found one another. And when the first two came and they called their friends or however they did it in those days, and more people came up. So the whole Manchester, Dorset area um, became not a colony, but a place that didn't just come for the summer. Some people did, some of them did. But many of them moved here and raised their families here. And 22 of them are buried in the Dorset Cemetery. So. Statistically, the population of Vermont would not have produced that many really excellent artists, but they came up, and they're still coming up, and we still welcome, and many of you have come up. We all came up at one point, so from down there, <laughs> wherever north is Canada and so forth. The deal was to buy a cheap old farmhouse and a farm that was maybe a little bit run down, turn the barn into the studio, uh, and, and create either, as Lyman said, either a summer studio or a year uh, studio. And what surprised me about researching who these artists were was not, not who they were in Vermont, but who they were back home. A lot of these artists were extremely well-known, talented, award-winning, recognized artists back home in Chicago, in Boston. A lot of them came out of the Museum of Fine Arts. One after the other came out of the Art Students League in New York City, uh, which is still there, by the way. And so their credentials back home are just shocking, and I wasn't quite expecting that. You know, when I was first handed the inventory of what the paintings were, I kind of flipped through it. Yeah, okay, a bunch of painters. I only recognized one or two of the names off the top of my head. But then when I started researching who they were before they came to Vermont or while they were commuting, you know, just coming up summers, a couple of artists 
Christ and you'll see just came up on uh, Winters, I was really shocked at how important and valued they were uh, on, on a national level. Many of these artists achieved national recognition. And uh, the reason they came to the forefront in Vermont is because starting in the 1920s, the New York Times started sending reporters up to Manchester to cover the shows that were being produced by what had been originally the group of Dorset painters. So in Dorset in the 1920s, they were kind of taking turns showing their art in each other's back rooms or barns or studios. And eventually they kind of outgrew that as more artists came to the area. And so they uh, said, well, let's have some shows in Manchester. So they first they had these outdoor shows, and then they had more shows uh, at the uh, Equinox Hotel. They filled up the whole hotel, the theater, the hallways, everything. Then they moved to uh, Burr and Burton Academy, filled up the gymnasium there. And these are some of the faces of some of the artists that, um, you know, uh, who were part of that original Dorset group and then later the Manchester group. And uh, this is how the show looked at Burr and Burton Academy. Mind you, tell us a little bit about how hectic it was and how people lined up to buy paintings. Well, yeah, they had the old Burr and Burton gym, and probably some of you remember it. It had a three-quarter balcony around the thing, so I think home basketball advantage was there because Pose and James were back and they were almost under the balcony and of course all the students are up there screaming at them and so on. So <laughs> for them. And, uh, but so here we have, look at these things, jammed together, lined up two rows, and yet um, the New York Times reporter was saying, come up and see how they do it in Vermont and see this art. And the locals started to want to paint and started to catch on. So they would lie in the sidewalk where the artists and their families and kids and everything would carry it in themselves. And so they go, wait, wait, how much is that one? And they started selling before they even got them into the gym. So the, the reporter, uh, Edward Alden Jewell, was his name, was fascinated by that. And so he wrote this full page and a half story in the New York Times. Every summer. And it was like, magical stuff. I mean, talk about lighting the place up. So that's how Manchester became such a place for artists to come and for people to come looking, looking for art. And it was the old-fashioned way of doing it. Now the question was, if they were having these art shows every year and they were hanging three or four hundred paintings every year for 20 or 30 years, I started asking myself, where the heck did all this art go? And then I met Wyman. <laughs> Uh, we were trying to match up some of these paintings with some of the ones in the brochures. We couldn't quite do it. But what was fascinating about the brochures is that the prices are on them. So for these paintings, it's like $25, $35. So everybody could afford the art. Everybody could buy it. So if you go to Southern Vermont Art Center, be sure to go to Gallery 4 and look for uh, the brochures that Sean has recreated. And he brought some artifacts to that gallery, too. Those are worth seeing. Go back one, I just want to. Uh, I'm standing in front of this wall, and I hadn't heard until a few years ago what salon-style hanging was. Donnell knew, and so it's this. And I so we had this is in the office. We had one big painting there, and I asked Donnell, "Do a salon style? Let's see what it looks like." And so this is what she came up with, and then we started using that in the Southern Vermont Art Center where the old rules, you know, one painting, eight feet of wall. We got too much stuff for that kind of <laughs> So we started using this and putting signs on them, and the little signs, and many of you have been there, which um, Nita wrote, are information in everyday language. And what was it I told you not to do? I had three rules when I started the project to write the book and then to follow up to write the labels for the, um, 
for the um, exhibition. And the three rules were use plain language, use short paragraphs, and don't write any artsy fartsy stuff. <laughs> so I'm looking at art, trying not to write any artsy fartsy stuff. So I was like, all right, how do I do this? Where do I find the voice in my head uh, that's going to be not art history and not art talk and not about the interpretation and the uh, you know metaphysical symbolism of a lone cow in the field as a representation of the dying agricultural economy. As a I couldn't write any of that stuff, so it was fun to go back to a lot of the old Vermont Life magazines, which uh, Lyman's father helped found and was the editor of for many years, and pull out some of those stories because in almost every case. For almost every one of these 200 some odd paintings in the collection, I could attach it to a story in Vermont Life magazine since the thing had run for 70 years. So um, I cheated. Tell <laughs> job. <laughs> now, here we have um, there's a place over there, you've been at the Art Center, but there's a place that you stand and face the camera to get your picture taken in front of this image of what is the cover of the um, book and was also a painting that was made into the Saturday evening post cover. Well, these two women cleverly turned around and had somebody take their pictures. And they are, you know? Casey, Jumper, Bailey, and her sister. Oh, yes, Casey, Jun Jumper, Bailey, and her sister, Amy, and a lot of you, you know, got those names right? Right. So they were very clever about that. So now they're going to fly. This is just a shot of the, um, I think this is Bennington, yeah, um, Bennington Museum, and people looking at the art, and if you can see, we, we hung it in groups together with the signs. There are about 55 paintings at Bennington. Uh, and I, uh, in two, two galleries. And uh, Bennington does have an elevator in the second floor, so you can access the collection. <coughs> now there's somebody who's really studying it. No, oh, he's reading the sign. He's reading the labels. <laughs> and that we, kept, we keep hearing back. One guy said, I used to go over to Southern Myers Center and I spent about 20 minutes and I walked through the blue bowl and I see him on it. Okay, I'm going. And he said, then I went to see this and I started reading the new signs and I looked at the painting and I read some mine. So I was there for almost three hours. <laughs> yes, so it slows people down. Stuff you can understand um, in everyday talk. And of course, I, I love, this is of course, hey, what do we, what do we use? When we need a little help in hand in Vermont, you know, we use sea poles you know, <laughs> study yourself year round. So I thought that was great capturing. The same poles that the people in the painting that she's looking at are using. So it's a charming <laughs> thing. So one of the things we did, uh, both in the exhibition and in the book, was try to break down the collection in some logical way. And typically, you would group an exhibition by artists or you would try to somehow do it chronologically by date, the early paintings, the later paintings. But Lyman had a theory about why it should be grouped by categories. So auctions is one of the categories. And as we go through these slides, you'll see the categories pop up, so you'll know when we're, we're switching categories. Do you want to tell us why you did that? Why you wanted the categories? Well, I, I wanted the categories, I think, in art museums and art centers and so on, they put shows on, but they're generally about an artist. That makes sense and that's fine. But this has got a lot of different artists. So I wanted to see how all the different artists would, they weren't painting the same auction, auction, or the same colored bridge, or the same barn or something, but of all different quote unquote levels of art. But if we were to have done it by the artists and the quote-unquote best artists would get the most space and somebody else would be relegated to the bathroom. So they're all artists and I'll talk to them about that a little more, but one of the things that this all reminds me of, of course, is how did I get started on this? And, and um, uh, when I was first married in 65 and 
had a little white house up on across the church on the hill, and we had a few scrap pieces from parents, and then we had eight beanbag chairs back in the day, and those were great until we started well, we these bicycle furniture. So we just started going to auctions and buying furniture, and then we started running into Barbara Mahato, Barbara Trask, when she lived up here, and we'd already been friends. So uh, we started noticing art getting sold and going, who knows? And then we, and, and she said, you know, you gotta start buying some of that, keep it in Vermont. And I said, well, that's a hell of an idea. So um, I did, and we did, and she was very helpful with all that, because I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. And so it was, put your hand up, keep it up if you really want something, and, and go ahead to the next one. Of course, all this is gone now with the internet, and nobody sets up in the backyard much anymore. Now, Bernadine Custer. She's from London Dairy. Her studio is a, a historical society and art center. Um, she taught at Pratt Institute down in New York City as her professional career. And uh, she and her husband, Arthur Jimmy Sharp, commuted back and forth every year. And I was surprised that she was there and well into her 60s. She was still teaching. And of course, those of you from London Dairy know that she left her estate, including piles of art right here. Uh, to uh, the uh, art center, and uh, this is another option scene. We, we like the, the trucks. I also want to emphasize that the uh, Orton collection isn't entirely uh, oil paintings. There's a lot of watercolors, prints, and you'll see a lot of that as we go along. This is Erwin Hoffman. I love this. Back up a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and of course, the London Area Historical Society is in her home, and Sally Ockham is here, and she's the one who called me up and said, why don't you come and do a slideshow um, in London Area? I said, how many people does the Historical Society seat? Not as many as this. So I said, well, call up the folks in Weston, and let's you know, put on a joint thing, and so she did. And thank you, Sally, for giving us that idea, and so that's what Bernie Custer means to me, is Sally calling me up and saying, put on a show. <laughs> Erwin Hoffman. Erwin Hoffman came out of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and uh, he had his home and studio in Cavendish. And he, uh, we'll see a couple of more things by him as we go along, but this often scene is charming. Uh, and that's his, mo his mom, Minna, down in the lower corner, the lady in the pink dress holding the sweater. And she's a charming touch that he, he put her in there. Uh, we know that Erwin Hoffman painted a lot of his neighbors in, along the tradition of uh, Norman Rockwell, who made his neighbors pose for his Saturday evening post covers. So there's a just chance that some of those people might be people that he knew in the neighborhood. He ultimately sold his property to the Solzhenitians and, uh, when he uh, left Cavendish. But it's a great little painting. Here's another one. Um, Kira Markham was an uh, actress, a painter, a woman about town, you name it, she did, in New York City. And she moved up to Vermont in 1946, a lot of these artists after the war, some before, and up in the uh, town of um, Halifax. Halifax, Halifax, Vermont. I'd never been to Halifax until Janice and I rode our bikes up there from Broadway one day. Oh my God, it's a long way to your own steep as hell. So, <laughs> so I don't know what he's done there. But, uh, so, it's, uh, so it, that's obviously there. You can tell it's just it's a charming thing. And we'll come upon some more of hers as we go along. We don't know if all those people have their hands in their pockets to avoid bidding or because it's a cold day. We can't quite decide. <laughs> Churches. Well, Many of you will recognize this ch church in my area. It's in a lot of the paintings I have. Of course, it burned down when? The 70s, I think. Hey, no, later. Who knows in my area? Who did it burn down? Sally. Five years ago. Oh, recently. 2010? That's close enough. But, so it's gone, and yet you'll see more, but that's looking down from the hill. Um, over at the uh, at the church, okay. And another, see, we're, we're now we're going through the church church thing. 
Baptist Church, East Silver, Leo Blake. Leo Blake actually lived uh, down across the border. He lived in Lanesboro, just a town, a little hill town outside of Pittsfield. But he painted a lot of Vermont scenes. This church is still there. Uh, and what's interesting about this church is that two, this painting is two things. The little shed behind the church is the warming shed, where you would keep your horses all day long. Don't forget, in the old days, church services used to last half a day or a whole day. You couldn't leave your horses out in the cold all day. So the little warming shed where they could be watered and fed. And the other interesting thing about this is that there's smoke coming out of the chimney on that church. So someone has gotten there early and lit the fires inside uh, to make sure the church is warm. You notice nobody's coming by car or truck. Everybody's coming by Slayer on foot. When Blake painted this painting, possibly sometime in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, there would have been automobiles, but it was much easier to still go by sleigh if the roads were rolled with the snow rollers. This is a very pretty painting, and this is up on the wall at uh, Bennington. Don't do don't click that back. Oh, I got more stories. You. Yes. <laughs> so th this serves up. Uh, when we first bought this, um, I asked to know, because it's got signs here that say East Over, West Over, Wardsboro, whatever, but I said, do you have any idea where that is? And she, well, it's down there somewhere. But So she called around and tried to find it, and she and her husband went out for a drive and found it and took photographs of it. And it's, of course, paved road now, and the entrance is no longer from the front, it's over on the side because the right away for the road, got pushed in closer. But as you see these paintings, think about, because we know that, we know a lot of other ones, but I'd like to know where they are, what you're looking at. And so, um, if you know, and we don't know, let us know or holler out, because we've had a lot of people on the search now, and it's become a thing on the internet. We got one woman who's on her third discovery of art that, Paintings that had no idea where the heck they were. And um, so, if you recognize something, make a note or call her out and um, you know, write it down. Now, I know you all know this, so you, you don't have to um, hollow that out. Of course, it's, it's Peru, Vermont, Peru General Shore, which is on, on your right there, and that, of course, has been replaced by the new store, um, Half Good Store in Vermont. And in the middle, um, not too many of you may remember, but the Bromley House, which is that hotel right in the middle, was a was a one of the early, even before skiing, but during skiing, and then became a ski hotel. And it, it had a great presence in the middle of town, but then it was um, burned down in whatever year that was, and that was very sad. But to me, this painting has a lot of meaning because, of course, you, know, you all recognize it. Peru Church, and that was where my parents were married in 1936, in the Peru Church. And so, it was always a mystery. Why were they married there? And my mother, Mildred Wilcox, Manchester Wilcox, the ice cream, best ice cream in Vermont, only ice cream. <laughs> and, um, they, it, went to the big congregational church in, in Manchester, as well as the Union Church um, down in Sunderland. Well, why did they get married in Peru? Well, I, years later, I didn't know this until I was about 12. My father had been married before and was divorced. Mm. And I had a child, who was my brother, but they referred to him as my half brother. I didn't know he existed until I was 12. And anyway, so I figured, well, maybe the family wasn't very darn happy with my mother marrying a divorcee. This is in 1936. I don't know. So that's sort of my part of my little family secret story. <laughs> This is Paul Sample. He lived on uh, Norwich. He was an artist in residence at Dartmouth College. And uh, this is a case where the painting was for sale. Uh, we all looked at it, and Lyman, as he just said, likes to buy paintings where there's a there there. And so the question was, where is the there there in this painting? And so, it, again, thank God for the internet. In a matter of, I don't know, less than an hour, we were able to kind of pinpoint where church was, uh, Beaver Meadow uh, Church in Norwich, and a, a little artistic 
getting licensed with the placement of certain bits and parts of it, but we ended up being able to identify a sample was a very uh, prolific illustrator, and you have seen his artwork whether you know it or not, because you know that maple syrup tin that has a little sugaring scene on it that was on like a thousand hundred million maple syrup port tins for a billion years? That was him. He did that. So you, if you've got one of those, you own a piece of Paul sample art. On the other hand, if you go to the Hood Museum in Hanover, the Dartmouth Hood Museum, in the 20s and 30s, his, his art was unbelievable. It was the, of that era of the Thomas Hart Benton kind of feel about it. And he got all of that there. And it's really worth a trip to go to Hanover just to see Paul's Paul sample. It's called American Realism and Regionalism, but I'm not allowed to use art talk. <laughs> <laughs> this, I put the title on a separate um, slide here because I just want you to read the title. I want you to especially enjoy this painting without any words on it. So I was looking through a um, book my father published at the Country New Press down at, beside the house in Weston um, and in the 20s, 30s, and in there was a photograph of the Union Church uh, on Hill Farm Road in Sunderland, which is south of Wilcox Farm. And, and it said Union Church where Arthur Ar Rockwell Kent painted Mother and Chicks. Rockwell Kent. He wouldn't have named it Mother and Chicks. I, I was very confusing. It sounds like some Kmart potholder series, you know? So, <laughs> anyway, so I, we couldn't find out, you know, then I was looking around, let me put an ad in the guide or something, and uh, wasn't it the guy in one of those magazines? And Jamie Franklin from the Bennington Museum. I was at the street, oh my God, somebody's got to go to their fireplace and they want to sell it, you know, and so on, and I'll go over and give them a six pack and $25. It didn't work out that way. But um, Jamie said, oh yeah, he knew about that. And he called up and came up and told us all about it and so forth. Still didn't know what it was. So then, because of the internet, started to put out um, alerts and turned up for sale uh, in, by a dealer in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And um, so I called him up and he said, well, this is a museum piece if I ever saw one. Every dealer says that. And, uh, so I said, well, okay, it looks a little dark to me. <laughs> so eventually we met in San Francisco at the airport and there was a chapel, so we went in there. Not in really intending to, but here we are in the chapel where it was quiet. And he took it out of his big suitcase and we studied it over. And then I, we started here dickering back and forth by email over what he thought was the price I should pay, what I thought the price I should pay. And we finally came to terms. And um, so, Puritan Church, Mother and Chicks, Rockwell Camp, very well done artist of his own day. Lyman's favorite subject is next. <laughs> <laughs> now, who remembers this? Moneyberry. Yeah. On the right, there's the bridge, the old iron bridge, which went away in one of those floods. And Adam's store, on the left, the Adam's brothers had taken over from their father, and it burned down. And mm. you know, you know, who knows, Sally, you know? Six, at 60s, right. And the brothers were, I don't know, 25 or 30 or something like that. So they were very, they said, what are we going to do? We're going to go to that place in their own room. So they were instrumental in getting the plaza south of Lineberry built and they they had they built a new store and it was the anchor store. They didn't call it that back then. But boy did they ever hit it just right because they started they had great need. They started stocking the things that all of us Julia Child generation who were putting on dinner parties and doing gourmet cooking and looking for all this stuff and so on. They had it. It was amazing. So they did a land office business uh, catching that wave of you know 
the Bulmers and so forth and so this it was a great, great time. And here we have uh, this is Landon Shore. I forgot to put a title on this one. Um, I threw in a whole bunch of Londoners slides last minute. Um, a burning custer painted a lot of local landmarks, the stores, the sawmills, the bridges. You'll see some of that. Uh, that was kind of her thing, was to just look out the, around the neighborhood, look, look at things where she lived, and to do these little, um, the sketches are uh, watercolor and pen and ink, all three mediums on, on one piece of paper. And um, she just, was just did gazillions of these, and uh, they're, everyone uh, has so much, I don't know, charm to them, and, uh, and, and they represent local landmarks. Here's the bridge again, uh, uh, the Iron Bridge, and another store there on the corner, Williams Store. So uh, if you're familiar with her work or you want to study her work, uh, go to the Londonary Historical Society, uh, and you'll learn a lot about it, and you'll see they do a show every now and then of her work. Now, now you don't have to tell me where this is. And Matthew Perry, who across the did this, is in the audience. Where are you, Matthew? Right there. There in the back. Yeah, um, well, Benson's garage, right across from the farm here. And what year did you paint this, Matthew? 84, 5, 6? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's close enough. I love this, one of my favorite paintings, because it captures that moment in time. And by the way, it's not just paint. The, the papers that are in the paper holder are little pieces of newspaper Matthew cut off and stuck in that thing. So it's, um, uh, it's painted and it's got um, collage. collage. It's got mixed media. Mixed media, all those terms, you know. Well, you don't know. Or you don't have to know. Anyway, there's a little airplane up there in the sky, and the, the friend of Malcolm's, the, the um, blonde in the BMW, New Jersey plates. <laughs> you know, all this was happening, and it was a heck of a rich time. But what I really love, okay, there's all these signs, and there, those signs he stuck on there, and of course you've got Budweiser, and you've got ammo. They go together. Papers, fireline. You've got um, uh, worms, and then you've got fine wine. Not just wine, but fine wine. And so worms, ammo, fine wine. What else do you need to So I just wanted to say too that not every you don't have to be dead to be in the orchid collection. Uh, there are quite a few living artists whose uh, work by me has collected, and uh, there are two Matthew Perry works uh, in the exhibition, uh, one at Southern Vermont Art Center, and this one is at Bennington. You recognize this place? And of course, next door to this place is the Ellie Blue store, which many of you ladies will remember. It was open Memorial Day and closed the end of October, and it was women's clothes, and Ellie Blue had been a New York City um, uh, buyer in the department, so I don't remember which one, and her, her friend, um, uh, Mrs. Ettinger, um, what was Mrs. Ettinger's? Betty Ettinger, same, same, it's the same thing, came up from New York, and she had a mop shop on the other side of the country store, and so that, those were wonderful little shops. And after Ellie Blue decided to close the store, and her manager took it over, CC for a while, we bought the building because we thought, well, we better have that. So, so we hired CC. Well, we might as well keep running it. We didn't have any plans for it, so CC was in there. And so I went over on Memorial Day, opening day, and customers came in. Woman comes up with her couple of dresses in her hand, said to me, can you put these away until they go on sale? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a business can I get myself into? <laughs> so, oh my God. So, I think after that, you know, we closed it. <laughs> anyway, Hazel Kitts, Myers, I had a studio in Peru. Uh, I ran across lots of little advertisements in the paper where she was giving classes and giving lessons uh, in her home studio and teaching classes. Uh, this is the only painting by her in the uh, Orton collection. 
And this is another season and another view. But of course, Harry Schaffer, probably all of you have, if, if, if any of you were living back then, he sent out a little, his serographs as Christmas cards. So if you hung on to those, you've got a heck of a memento. But of course, this is a, a serograph. He did a lot of oils, but he was really famous for his serographs. Was hired by the WPA uh, during that uh, the depression to write a book on to, for other artists on how to make serographs that were look like paintings. Before that, they were all blocky. So the guy was a, a genius and a developer of it, and, and wrote the book, and and artists have followed that. So um, there we are. So covered bridges. I had this idea a few years ago that there ought to be a law passed that no artist in Vermont can paint a pine tree, a birch tree, a red barn, or a covered bridge. I was like, everybody go out and find something else. But Lyman cured me of that. What that would be different. <laughs> what size me in to really look at the collection of covered bridge paintings that he, that he has? I totally changed my opinion. So I may paint a covered bridge this winter. I will say. Yes, yes. Well, of course, we all love covered bridges, and what's wrong with that? But I especially like them and keep buying covered bridges, paintings of covered bridges in Vermont because the art establishment hates them. <laughs> I come to hate them. Never, I won't say that. But the art establishment, you know, is top down. It's very elitist, and some of you will probably have art shops and everything. Calm down, it's okay. Um, but it, it is, has rules. And it, most of the rules have been written down. Nobody knows who made them, and they're all negative. You can't do this, you can't do that. And like God, if you made a covered bridge and you're an established artist, you're going to get drummed out of a club. That happened to Luigi Muccioni. Luigi Lucci freaking out of love. <laughs> he started to paint some bonds, and he started to say, oh, well, he's drunk. You're not, that's him. That's the end of him. Well, he was too good to be put into that side pasture back for you or whatever. So, anyway, I love Cover Bridge. He is one of the artists who was a winter artist. He spent his summers in Rockport. He was uh, so, uh, really a founding member of the Rockport Art Association up on Cape Ann, north of Boston. But he was also a captain and founder of the Rockport baseball team. If he wasn't an artist, he would have had a career as a baseball professional baseball player. And his studio was in Jamaica, but he went all over the place uh, 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 doing art. And here he is painting in the winter. Uh, he told the story in his biography uh, that one day he was painting out in the snow like this. He used to look kind of dig a hole to put his easel and his feet in and then put his painting stuff up on top of the snowman. And one day a big chunk of wind came blew all his stuff away and uh, he just said, oh, forget it. And he packed up what he had left and went home. And he said when he went back in the spring in the snow melt that he found his two the oil paint, they were so good. And he was like, so now you know what I don't paint in watercolors. <laughs> That's him. This is a Neil group bag. Uh, his studio was up in um, Jeffersonville. Uh, again, another one of the winter artists. He was a contemporary of Audra River. And a group bag. Um, was another one who uh, was part of the Gloucester Art Association and a founder up in Gloucester again on Cape Ann. So we have Mirbert in Rockport, just up the road a little ways, uh, uh, Mio Coupe. His daughter still runs a gallery uh, and does uh, exhibitions of his artwork, and she's up in Jericho. So if you're ever up in that neck of the woods, and uh, this is another cover bridge. Did we, did we ever find this one? Or were we just making guesses? We like to find things. We're not sure, so if anybody knows where that is, take a picture of it, or tell us you know, or what. We've been, we've been nagging the Covered Bridge Society people to death. Like, where is this one? Where is that one? This one we uh, did find. This is in Warren. This is Walton Blodgett. He lived in Stowe. Yeah, he, he moved to Stowe in the late 40s, I think. and. Did watercolors, and uh, the other collector of his work 
is the trap family uh, in their lives. They have a lot of Walton Blige blood, blood paintings, and I was always really taken by them. Yeah, the watercolors are spectacular. Yeah, yeah, and he, um, but he died early because he was a, he loved to fish, and he went to Canada to fish, and he was wearing long waders or something, drowned himself, oh, yeah. which was so sad because, you know, so he was in his 50s or something like that. Are you thinking of Atherton? Him too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you take a trip? <laughs> <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> 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 uh, oh dear. <laughs> Cecil Cross the Bell, um, I stopped upon and my gosh, what, what an artist. He used to come up with his wife in the summer to Stockbridge, and a farmer there, the first couple summers, said, you can pitch a tent over across the brook uh, in my pasture, and they did, and spent the summer. He lived in New York, and was a teacher, professor down there, and then they decided to bring friends up, and then one year they came back, and the farmer had built a log cabin, and so then they had a cabin, and they sort of added on to that. But this one is uh, royalty in Vermont, and you know, the carnival comes to town and captures all that excitement and we all remember as kids when the carnival came to town. And um, I have a friend who lives in Royalton, so we, we made up, Donnell did a, um, um, a print of this, a, a G, G, G Clay print. It's on canvas, it looks, looks like it, and put you say on there, it's a reproduction. And so I gave it to him, and it's hanging in the town offices in, in Royalton, Vermont now, as so, because that's where it is, and that's where that should be, but not the original. Yeah. I especially love the uh, children in the flying chairs. Uh, in his other life, he's lived on Staten Island, uh, and uh, we're going to see some more of his paintings, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about him. Now, this is Grace. Some of you may have heard of Grace and the art uh, program up in Hardware. Well, grassroots art and community effort. And I heard about them from Chet Kaznowski, who used to live in Weston. And a fellow from Brooklyn came up to, before it was Grace, to a nursing home to get a job as a cook in a dishwasher, you know, artists coming to Vermont and so forth. And this was a nursing home. A lot of old people, obviously. And one day he got this idea to have them paint. So he went out and bought all the materials and brushes and whatever. And he said, I want you to try painting. He never tried to teach them how to paint. But he said, think back to your younger years and just let your memories take over. And then try to capture those memories however you can. And so, turns out, a whole bunch of these people were or turned into artists. Maggie Smith here captures the, you know, this is under the whole village center, village fair stuff, and there she is with another little village fair uh, in her way of doing it. And so, she's next to Cecil Bell, who's a professional artist, and so I went up there with Chet in the late 70s and was taken by it and, and met Don Sonsuri, a guy who had come up as a younger man, and started all this and said, can I buy some of these? He said, oh, I don't know what I ever asked for, but I guess so. So, we didn't say that, he said, bro, but anyway, um, so I bought some and went back and bought some more. I thought, well, these artists would be thrilled to get money for what they're doing. And they were. So I kept buying those, and it, I just love them. You'll notice in the exhibitions at Bennington and Southern Vermont Art Center that the Grace artwork is not separate from the professional artists, because we don't consider that category of professional and non-professional. We just said they're all artists, and it doesn't make any difference. So you're out to find a Maggie Smith hanging next to a Rockwell Kent. And, and we're just not making a distinction between the amateur artists or the listed artists. They are professionals. I paid them for the work, so I just not professional. So. <laughs> Anybody recognize this pair? Yeah, were you there back then? <laughs> Apparently. What, 
What year was this? this now? Bonneville. Oh. The 40s, so we figure out that it must have been around the 40s? Yeah. The famous Bonneville Fair, the oldest fair in Vermont. And um, I was so excited when this, this came up at auction, didn't it? Yeah. And oh my God, it's Albert O'Hibbert again. And it's like, this is exactly what I love to get a hold of. Is this kind of thing? Show them there, show them what's going on. And here, now we go back to Cecil Crossbell, the horse pulls, and um, those horses have taken off. You all probably said, if you haven't been to a horse pull, you've got to go while you're still alive. And um, the, so, but this reminded me of this little kid over here. is running like hell. And when I was uh, a youngster, one of my best friends in Weston was Arthur Foster, not related to the other Fosters, but he lived up uh, at the top of Piper Hill in the White House that um, Wayne and Debbie restored and so on and then sold it. And anyway, um, and his uncle Herman did this. He had a couple of working horses and he trained them and so on and then he'd go to the um, fairs and he taught Arthur how to hook on the ring onto the hook. So the ring was on the horses and the hook was on the sled and he dropped the ring over the hook. Now, we were like nine, ten years old. Why the little kids? Because we can skip out of the hell out of there faster than we're going to We get to him more fast and the minute the horses hear that clank of the iron against iron, they take off. So did he. And then I said, please, let me do it, Harman. Let me do it. So I did it a few times. Oh, my God. But, you know, when you're, you're that age, your heart can beat 200 times a minute. So um, it was really the most exciting thing I ever done. So. Bill painted a lot of horse paintings uh, in New York City, the working horses that pulled cabs and pulled um, you know, wagons and stuff in New York City, the police horses. You'll see horses a lot if you uh, go through any portfolio of um, Cecil Bowen. This is, this is one of uh, Lucioni's well-known paintings that I bought at auction. And the story, I, I got to know um, the curator at the Shelburne Museum because they put on a show a few years ago, a Lucioni show, who well deserves his own show. And so I loaned him a, a couple of paintings and loaned him photographs for the catalog and so on. And so I, I was, um, I'd heard this story and I asked Katie, the curator, I said, is it true, because I'd heard this before I bought it, that Mrs. Webb, who started the Shelburne Museum, um, and took Muccioni on her arm, wealthy people back in those days did that. They, you know, you know they were um, not sponsors, but patrons, patrons. patrons. And um, so, apparently, um, Mrs. Webb had asked Luigi, to paint a painting for her daughter's wedding. She said, we think it's true, but we can't prove it. We can't prove it's not either. I'm like, how the hell did we get out of their family if that was true? Anyway, I bought it. And, uh, <laughs> but then, it's gone. Katie and I roamed around, that's Lake Champlain in the background, that's Sheldon Bay, that's the end of Sheldon Point. It should be easy to find. It's gone. It's been gone for years. We could not determine where it was. Different type that she talked to some old timers and they said, oh, it's that barn over there. It wasn't that barn, you know. Anyway, then a year goes by, a couple years go by or more, and a customer of ours got our catalog and the book was for sale there and it was happening to be open to the page, the picture of it, of the barn. And she said, I just got your catalog, she emailed me, and I saw that was my grandfather's barn. <laughs> wow! And I said, where was it? Where was it? And she said, well, it burned in 1977, and we sold the land it was on. It was, it was on the Champlain side of Spear Street, and their house and the other barns were on the other side. So she said the city of South Burlington, I guess it was, wanted to buy it for an overlook. And there's still the 
Champlain Overlook if you go up Spear Street, right there. So we had the place, we had the family, and then she had photographs. And the photographs she had showed one side along the other side. You know, Pat, what's going on? She says, you know, you're right, I don't know. Then she, her older brother says, well, um, they started to rob the, the, the um, silos, but they, the good one, they took down, put it back together on the other side of the barn, and she has pictures of that, and the pictures of that, the barn's white. <laughs> Jesus. Now, now where are we? So, I said, what do, you, what do you suppose? I mean, at the first I was thinking, Lucci only took a white barn and made it red. <laughs> and then she finally, two weeks ago, got a hold of a, her oldest brother who said, you know, my father told me that at one time it was red and then they painted it white. They whitewashed it. And it used to be that white was very expensive to do. And so people were well painted the barns white and everybody else painted them red because you know you can make you can make red on the farm because you start with you put your cow and you take the blood and throw that in and start it out and that gives you the red. And um, so and you got cream and milk and that's how you do it. So that was cheaper and then whitewash came along, so that was cheaper. And the um, idea that dairy barns was supposed to be clean and crisp and pure, so they thought, okay, and the, all the other barns are white, so they must have painted it white, because it was inconceivable to me that a farmer would change the color of a barn um, because it's not cheap to do that. Well, it got cheaper and they did it, so the barn survived until it burned down. That's the rest of the story. So, <laughs> so she and her two sisters and her three daughters and two grandchildren came down um, last Sunday and we all went to the Bennington Museum where that is and took pictures and had a great, you know, gathering. So it was great fun. So now we'll put it all together and Janelle will do her magic and we'll put out a pamphlet brochure or whatever. Cool. <laughs> keeps happening, you know, as people are going to the exhibition, uh, they are uh, correcting my labels. We have had to pull a couple down and put up new info, schoolhouses and this, that, and the other thing that we got mixed up with. So it's been really interesting. Lucioni, as you know, lived in Manchester for uh, many years, had a studio here, but he also kept the studio in New York City, lived with his two sisters, and he's another artist that made the trip back and forth every spring, every fall between uh, Vermont and uh, New York City. And again, in the city, he was so widely acclaimed and so well known. This is Mary Hughes. Mary Hughes' studio was in Palmau. Uh, she was uh, basically based out of uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, but kept the summer studio over in Palmau. Palmau, I still can't say that right. Palmau. And uh, she had a lot of these farm seeds. And this is of the era of the uh, WPA, the Work Progress Administration, when artists were paid to do artwork. Typically, you got an assignment from a supervisor, you got maybe $75 to go out and do one or two works of art of the great American scene. So it's called American Scene Painting. And uh, Marion Hughes uh, not only did these paintings, but she was a supervisor herself. She also had an art school in, um, in uh, Springfield, uh, but her paintings are just so um, representative of the era, and they're exciting and they're very beautiful to look at. There are a couple in the collection of these scenes of uh, threshing. They're threshing. They're threshing. This isn't hay, it's wheat. And then you see all the mechanism and stuff, and they're threshing it to get the wheat kernels off the stems and so on that they can then take to the mill and get ground. And, but now tell her, tell them, tell them about the Marion Hughes as a woman and the number of women. Oh yeah, this is so interesting. So you'll see a lot of men's names on these slides. And so I got curious about the whole collection. And I was like, well, what if we just had to break this down and put all the men in one gallery and all the women in another gallery? And I thought, how many galleries would it take to fill up the museum with paintings just by women? And it turned out 
you need a lot of galleries. About 20% of Lionel Martin's collection is works of art by women. So it was really a surprise. Many of them were on the uh, board of directors for the early years of the Southern Vermont artists when they formed their organization. And then when they purchased Jester House in the 1950s in Manchester, many of the women artists continued to serve uh, on the board at um, high executive levels. So it was exciting to learn about how they were just like, I don't want to say the wrong thing here, how they were just one of the boys um, uh, in their careers uh, here in Vermont. This is Leo Blake. This is a little watercolor. It's actually quite small, but there's something about this painting that everybody stops and looks at it for a really long time. It has a certain light to it. Uh, I love the fact that you see the fact that this farmer is not plowing on a flat, level field like somewhere out in Nebraska or Kansas. He's trying to plow a hillside. And uh, it's just a lovely pause where you know the horses are standing there patiently waiting uh, for him to fix the plow. And you see the long distance view as well as the field in the foreground. It's a very pretty little watercolor. So landscapes are the biggest category in the uh, collection. They go on and on and on. So we're going to try to go through these a little bit more quickly than we have been so far. This is James Hope. This is the earliest painting in the collection from the 1850s. Hope was a Scotsman who came to the Vermont area through Canada. He had a bazillion jobs. He eventually lived in uh, Clarendon, I mean in Castleton, uh, and he did this painting of what was then the watering hole at Clarendon Springs. Now that white building that you see in the very dead center of the painting is still there. Uh, it's been for sale, not for sale, it's been this or that, but it's recently been revived as an antiques shop again. So if you happen to be wandering up the road to Rutland, you can take a little detour over to Clarendon Springs. It's down the kind of windy road and actually see that, that building has been mostly cut it out. A few of those buildings that you see on the landscape remain there. But what I love about this painting in particular is you see the landscape as it was in those days when there were no trees um, and the landscape was fairly bare. But I, I particularly love this painting. And, and it was about a mile west of the Rutland Railroad that went up to Rutland, so people could come up from the city uh, and spend the summer taking the waters. And the waters were just Vermont spring water, went into the stream and so on. But, you know, if you were cured, you were cured. Yeah, one lady wrote in her journal that it was a really good spa and a really good watering hole because the water didn't taste like anything, therefore you could drink a lot of it. <laughs> Whatever that meant. This is Dean Fawcett. Uh, he eventually came uh, and settled full time in uh, Dorset. He was one of the Dorset painters a little bit later than some of the earlier ones. He, he came out of the Midwest originally, and uh, this painting has a uh, you talk. Yeah, a lot of his papers are still at Brigham Young uh, University Library there. And this painting is called Derby View. Not because it's Derby, Vermont, but Lionel will tell us what Derby View is. Well, there's a road called... Um, Derby View. No, it's, there's a road in front of it, a small road called Derby View, which is off Rupert Mountain, that goes from Dorset over to Rupert. And, so, and it's one of the things that my biking buddies, like Janice, who always beats me up there, ride up there, off in Penny. And um, anyway, the story here was, it came up, and I started to do some research, and it, it was being deaccessioned by MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. Hmm. Now, modern, so um, they finally were headed up for sale. And the story is that when they first opened MoMA, President Eisenhower was asked to come and take a tour. You can get the president to come. You're doing great. So he did. But a guy from Kansas, and he's probably going, oh, what is this stuff? And then he comes to this one. He says, I like that one. A month later, it magically shows up in the White House. <laughs> so get hung in the White House. Now, in the world of bands, provenance is everything. And so that's part of the story of it. Yeah, and it looks up the Medellin Valley, and you see and Fawcett was a great artist, and this lovely valley that we still love to cycle through, ride through. Um, and um, so that's 
In the Boston Painting in 38 or 39, it was first exhibited in 1939 at Southern Art Center, and, um, and then and he showed it at a moment in New York, and they bought it as a purchase prize, which is how it ended up at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in the first place. But um, again, what's interesting about this group of paintings and this group of artists is that all these people whose names we're seeing on these screen, they all exhibited together in Manchester 100 years ago, and now they are all back together exhibiting in Manchester, except they're dead now. <laughs> well, most of them. Except for men. So it's just fascinating. Once the exhibition was up, especially at Southern Vermont Art Center, and I walked through the galleries, I had a terrible moment of nostalgia for these artists, for these men and women. I felt like, oh man, they should be here to see this, you know? And it was just like, there were, like, I don't want to say there were ghosts all over the place, but there was a lot of ghosts all over the place. A lot of people know the work of Arthur Jones. Well, Arthur was born in Dorset and grew up there and obviously had a talent for painting and was a lot self-taught and he got more lessons and so on but fell in with the other artists who were there and started you know, bringing his, his works, he was younger than, than there. And in Dorset, um, unless you know it, there's a place called Dorset Hall, which is sort of northeast of Dorset and there's an upper hollow road and a lower hollow road and the lower one is below and the upper hollow is the one you see there. And it's a really beautiful, magical place. And so we have, I have photographs now, I had to climb a tree because all grown up now. And that is a farm there and a house and that's all gone. But in the upper center looks like a, some plowed up earth and some maybe a crop growing. And now, everything's the same. There aren't as many open pastures, of course, but there's a house being built there, or was built, a, you know, a very beautiful house, but it sort of stretched out with the, with the land, so I thought, now that is a good way to do a house. They're gonna do an expensive house, so it doesn't detract from the beauty of the um, source of house. So great to have um, uh, Arthur Jones's piece there. Another view of the hollow. I think if you lived in um, Dorset, you had to think at least 10 paintings a year of the hollow in every season. This is Claude Bernard. He was uh, from France originally. He had been a waiter in France, met some Americans traveling, and invited him to come to the States and look him up sometime. So he did. And uh, he became a painter. He eventually took classes in New York City at the Art Students League. And, uh, and, and his work was originally considered like primitive, kind of naive kind of, kind of work. But the more you look at his work, the better and better it gets. So um, he had a great career. He served in the legislature for a while. He tried to run for the United States Senate. I don't think that worked. So you'll run across uh, Claude Barron in a lot of the uh, uh, galleries for this exhibition. This is John Lilly, another one of the Dorset painters. Uh, and uh, uh, this used to be, as of two weeks ago, the only John Lilly in the uh, Orton collection but we've managed to dig up a few more, thanks to a couple of uh, people who have made them available. So there'll be more John Lilly paintings added to the collection. Lilly was a house builder, a carpenter, a mason, a jack of all trades, a son of a farmer, uh, doing all kinds of stuff. I followed his census records uh, through the 40s, and it's like every 10 years he's like farmer, carpenter, Mason, and then all of a sudden the census records are John Lilly, artist. He got quite famous, he showed his work in New York, it was a big shock uh, that he knew how to paint and that he learned how to paint. And this, uh, line, I believe, this is a view of uh, Danny Mountain. Yeah, well, we we're waiting for confirmation, so... I got yeah, two cents on that, but it's a beautiful little painting. And again, uh, Luigi was showing, he painted a gazillion of these birch tree things. They were in six. <laughs> they were kind of, um, they were kind of his bread and butter. He painted these for many, many years, and then finally one day he said, "That's enough with the birch trees." But uh, he did these as paintings as well as etchings. So you'll see uh, in some of the cases where he took his original paintings and then recreated the exact same scenes and uh, things as etchings. A lot of these were done out on the golf course at uh, the uh, Equinox. The Juan. A Juan. I got to practice that. The Juan. It's the golf course. Juan is the private club. You can tell it's from Rhode Island. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, this was where he used to set up his easel. Now if you're online at all, you can go to PBS television and just type 
Raven PBS Television Religio Trinity Manchester, and you'll get a lovely little 30 minute beauty video of him, you know, driving up to the golf course and setting up his easel and going home for lunch and then coming back in the afternoon and painting some more birch trees. And it's one of those old fashioned, what, I don't know, what year was that? The 60s. 60s. But it had, it might as well have been out of the 30s or 40s. That same male voice, it is in all the documentary, you know, it's, he's the actor, I don't know who he is, he must do them all. But you, you would remember the voice, hear the voice, and, and the, the music in the background was this sort of strange music that, wait, every documentary back then was that way, including this one. This is Jay Conway. His studio was uh, in North Rupert, but he was also instrumental in founding and teaching classes at the uh, Southern Vermont Art Center. But he was also a teacher in Manchester, uh, Manchester uh, school system where he taught art. And uh, we got to interview a few people who were his students when he was a painter there. A lot of people know his work by name. He was up on Monhegan Island for 17 years or something like that, and then uh, ended up coming here his life uh, here in Vermont. I love this painting because it isn't about the mountains. This is one of the few paintings in the collection where the mountains don't occupy that middle ground in the painting. They're very low on the horizon, which makes this quite a beautiful painting. He was quite a character. Always had a cigarette in his mouth, we were told. Whether he was in a classroom or not, he was always smoking a cigarette. And he used to like jab at the paint uh, canvas with his paintbrush. And the kids loved him because he was a little bit crazy. Harriet okay. Sanchez the only painting in the collection by her. She was another one of the Dorset artists. Uh, again, a seasonal painter who came back and forth to New York City. She also had a career in the theater. And apparently her stage name was Tarzan. And we can't quite figure out why. She had big wild hair. Maybe that was it. Uh, but these are these pretty little landscapes. And here again, you see what I was talking about with the uh, mountains as the, the middle ground. Uh, supposedly someone's writing a book about her. And we have John Matthewson from the Dorset Historical Society to thank for a lot of information about uh, the Dorset painters. He's just a endless resource. I'm going to let you do Ace the Shabbats. You love him. Well, I love Ace the Shabbats, as she says. And these are small engravings, wood engravings, which is if you take a log, the end, that's the end grain, and you have you have your little instruments, and you carve into those in reverse, of course, because what sticks up gets printed, and what doesn't doesn't. So every single blade of grass, every single tree leaf, is astounding the technique that this guy had, and there's a number of them because I just love them and kept. Whenever they come up, they don't come up much. I get them, but it's so serene. It's summer. There's not a breath of wind. There's no cow. There's no tractor. There's no horses. There's no people. And yet, you can't ever have enough of just looking out. And your heart slows down. I think that's a good thing. It's just wonderful. And we, if you, you've seen the book, or if you haven't bought it, you can buy it. By the way, you buy it, and I was going to be selling them out there. You can buy it all before you leave. And, uh, Plus a dollar. So, uh, and uh, anyway, it, it, we use it in, the, in there for chapter heads. Yeah, in the chapter heads. Ace Shedders was out of Springfield, uh, but he did a lot of work in, uh, uh, up in the Berkshire areas and again into Vermont. So we know for a fact that these are, in fact, Vermont. And I can't emphasize enough how tiny these are. Uh, what else for fun stuff? Again, one of the Dorset painters. Uh, this is North Rupert Valley, that sort of looks a little bit like Dorset Hall. Uh, Farnstad, again, one of the founders of the Southern Vermont Art Center, very instrumental, served on the board. A gentleman's gentleman, supposedly. He was always quite dressed up, did not have the typical bohemian look to him. There were newspaper articles that commented on him. And these are quite uh, beautiful paintings. Sometimes when I come down into Manchester, where you have that long view uh, coming in from the direction I come from, you see hillsides like this. And I go, oh, that's a fun stop day today. And uh, this is Rockwell Kent. Rock, this is one of the, the first Rockwell Kent painting I bought many years ago from an auction at the Southern Mont Art Center. And so I can't say it escaped Vermont, but we sure kept it in Vermont. And this is um, Equinox 
He, Radical Kent was extremely famous in his, in his age, in his era. Everybody knew him from his paintings. He illustrated the original Moby Dick book. He, um, he lived in Vermont from 1919 to 1925, something like that, up at the end of the road, um, Red Mountain Road, which is on Route 7A, north of Arlington, but south of Sunderland. And this is an interesting painting. You can't see it here, but when we got it, to now have it x-rayed and cleaned, and lo and behold, we discovered that he had painted over something else that was in the foreground. And it was a horse with a, a sort of a, a human being, couldn't tell which, um, on the leaning back uh, on the horse like this, and the horse's head was thrush, thrust forward. And if you look at the painting itself, you can just make out that faint horse. So one might say, well, that makes it worth nothing. Hell oh, no, that's great because artists did that sort of stuff. And the fact that we discovered it and didn't know it, and once you know it, look at it, you can see the horse there. So oh, it's such a wonderful, wonderful piece to have. Lonnie Gonzalez, this is another great artist. Roland Rochette was in his 80s when he began painting. He had been working in logging camps at one point in his life. He had a lot of different jobs. And uh, he created these assemblages. They're all about the same size. They're about 22, 3 inches square. He built the frames himself. And uh, the reason he started painting was because he was part of the Grace program. And he, uh, he, he said, well, if Grandma Moses can do it, so can I. That was like his entire motivation to start painting. He was living on a, a retirement income of like $60 a month or something, and he thought he could earn a few bucks if he uh, started doing these paintings. He sold his first one at a church fair for $5. He has been published in many art books. You will run across his name. Uh, and it's usually under the category of folk art, uh, which it, I don't quite put it under that category. Uh, but here he has depicted a, a logging camp, and we even have a little written description that he gave of why they put hay on the, on the slope there to keep the horses from uh, going down too fast and keep the logs from sliding. So it was just so interesting, and last year was quite a collection of the uh, uh, Roland Rochette uh, uh, paintings. And again, they're all the same frames, and he even painted the frames, some of them. Uh, there are village scenes, there are logging scenes, there are country store scenes, blacksmith shop scenes, um, boats on the lake scenes, fishing scenes. He even did Mount St. Helens once uh, 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 in one of his scenes. So they're just uh, fascinating. Here again, the lake logging with oxen all the time and place. I often wonder if some of these artists were painting this stuff because they thought it might be the last time anybody in Vermont would see this. That from then on they'd be logging with caterpillars and snowmobiles and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, uh, Blake did a lot of these kinds of uh, uh, rural scenes of uh, logging with uh, oxen. And then of course once you cut the logs you have to bring them to a sawmill. This is Beatrice Jackson Humphreys, another one of the Dorset painters. This is Edgerton's Mill at the foot of uh, Dorset Mountain. And then this is her husband, David Humphreys, with another scene of uh, Dorset. Now there are quite a few uh, paintings by uh, David Humphreys in the collection, which you'll see, you'll see primarily at Southern Vermont uh, Art Center. And there were, every town had a sawmill back in the day, and then fewer and fewer. Um, and now it, only a few big ones exist because the regulations, it's so expensive. I don't know what workers' compensation costs to get that kind of insurance to work in a sawmill. But it's it's kind of sad to see them all gone uh, because we still need to cut out the boards and so on. But that's a different story. Ah, we have, is Tommy here? Tom Ettinger, the son of Churchill Ettinger. See you, my friend. So, I love this because Churchill skied at Brownland, and then and he lived north of town, six miles north of town, um, just before you start out the last house before. I don't 
Jim. Yes, Jim Lindell lives in the house now. And um, so he skied at Brown, and then Stratton opened in 1960, and so church started painting over there. And this one captures Brownies in the background and captures that skier and that style of skiing of my generation of skiers from who really got good at skiing in the 50s and 60s. And we were all wearing we wore stretch pants. Everybody was concerned about looking good and all that. Get your feet together and so on. There it is, that style. So if you grew up then and you recognize that style, then it changed. You skated your feet wider apart, and the stretch pants went away, and CD Bonnie came out of his line of stuff, which was terrific and a lot more practical than stretch pants. So there's a lot more meaning in this than just a skier on the side of scratching out. So. Churchill, as you know, was an illustrator, and a lot of people know his work, but not his name, because it appeared in a lot of hunting and fishing books. Uh, and periodicals and magazines. So I'm going to just run through a couple of these. Lyman has a whole series of these uh, little uh, uh, etchings of uh, uh, wildlife scenes, and they're beautiful. They're small, they're beautiful, um, they're, in, they're engaging. We're back to here with Marco here. This in here is another outdoor scene. Uh, I tried to find where Hope Pond was, I never found it. Uh, but uh, she is another artist who did a painting and then also did an etching of the same. Uh, outdoor sea, just a joyful little uh, winter sea. This is Paul Star at Sample again, uh, an outdoor hunting scene. Lyman says he bought this painting because nobody in their right mind would want a painting of a dead deer hanging in their living room. Except for Vermont. This is one of Lyman's favorite favorite paintings, and I'll let him tell you why. Well, I love it because, not because we don't know who H. Weber was, which we don't. We try to find out who it was, so whatever. And we don't exactly know where it is, but it sure looks a lot like Lake Champlain, and they did a lot of ice fishing on Lake Champlain. And I love how it's so freaking cold. <laughs> it's cold. It feels cold. And Best of all, you see on the outskirt, the, the little um, shanties, as they're called, and then as they get closer and they get a little more dense, and then as you come forward on the painting, um, there's the fisher people down around. Uh, they're on the village green, as it were. So I see west of the village green, all that sort of thing, except it's on ice, and it, you gotta get the stuff off before spring so it doesn't melt and float away. So it, I keep it in my office because I'm just so enchanted by the painting. Even though we have no idea who, who it was, and not in any books or anything else, but if somebody ever comes across an H. Weber as a painter, please let me you know. I looked through months and months, years and years and years of census data, find a grave, I never found the H. Weber. Shivering is a big theme in the collection. There are a lot of paintings of Shivering. Here's Churchill Attinger again, uh, uh, sugaring the old-fashioned way. Uh, he also reminded us that other things live in the sugar lot as well. Uh, bears uh, with the blue tubing that they use now. Uh, they have finding bite marks in the blue tubing. We don't know what animals are making the bite marks, but uh, they are still attracted to the sugaring season. Uh, this is Ruth Green Mold. She's a portrait artist, and some of her portraits of of uh, the state's distinguished um, Supreme Court justices and whatever are part of the state collection of the Capitol, um, the Capitol um, uh, in Montpelier. Uh, again, a, a beautiful a little um, sugaring scene. And here again, Emilio Grupe, uh, sugaring this time with horses. It's much better to sugar with horses, according to um, many people, because if you're on a tractor, you can't say, whoa. Um, if you're on a caterpillar, you just gotta get on the thing, get off the thing. Whereas if you're just walking slowly uh, next to a team of horses, according to Neil Perrin, who wrote that famous book, Amateur Sugar Maker, you just say, whoa, and after a couple times you're on the sugar lot at the beginning of the season, the horses know when to stop anyway. You don't even say, whoa, anymore. I um, thought your favorite, you know, oxen. I like oxen, yeah. Oxen are better than horses. Well, oxen 
there for lying um, in that they will pull with all their strength without ever stopping. Whereas horses, if you give them too big of a load, they're like, yeah, no. They will quit on you, but oxen will never quit on you. Um, horses pull uh, uh, with their um, neck, but oxen pull with their shoulders. This is one of Ryan's favorite things. He's had uh, many uh, hours on a soapbox talking about it, and here he is up at the Capitol building and uh, making speeches about the right to hang your clothesline out in front of your house. Well, and now in Vermont, they get this thing about clotheslines, and because of the other work I do with Community Heart and Soul, I've discovered that every gated community in America and every homeowners association in America, the lawyers all go to the same place, and here's the boilerplate, and every single boilerplate contract agreement for the HOA says you can't put your laundry outdoors. <laughs> what? No, not a such a thing. So I attribute it to the fact that everybody did it at one point, and then washing machines came along in what, the 30s, 40s. I remember my mother got a washing machine in the 40s, and my God, she was happy that she'd gotten a Rolls Royce, which probably seemed like about as much money. And But the other part of it is, I think, that they don't want to see other people's laundry because those people are the 10 people, and they're de classe, and the people who live in the gay communities aren't. So I have this little thing about that. Give me a break. Come on, people. So I teamed up with our Windsor County Senator, County Senator, who was running a bill through about we got a right to put our solar panels on our roofs, because I know people were complaining about those. And he said, I love clothes drying, too. So we teamed up, went up to Montpelier, and and now you can both put up a solar panel on your roof, and you've got the right to dry. And you to sell. And then we had a million clothes pins made up called the right to dry, and we bought them for a penny and sold them for a dollar at the Vermont Country Store. <laughs> Red house on the right, 
used to be the Simon's house, the Simon's farm, and they lived there and had the farm across the street, and then they sold it to the playhouse after Raymond Austin created the playhouse out of the old church, and but somebody apparently left a glue pot on and caught on fire, and when Tom and I ran up the street and they came down with the fire truck, everything was engulfed, and I went in with a hose, and it was like, oh my God, I'll never forget the all of the murals on the walls of the old playhouse, Roy Williams, beautiful murals. And I said, I'm not spraying a hose on those. <laughs> and it wasn't much hope of anything anyway. So it was, oh, such a sad, that I just never forget that. But the, the flames weren't licking, but they were going to take those down, and we had to get the heck out of there. This is writer Jimmy Sharp. He was born in England. He was married to Bernadine Custards, is the old London Dairy Firehouse. This is Mitzi Gower again, trying to get Ripton. Uh, we sent this uh, uh, painting to Ripton to try to figure out what street it was, what church it was, and everybody we talked to in Ripton said, that's not Ripton, so we're just going <laughs> We need help. She yeah. thinks the artist thought it was Ripton, but they got nothing. Um, so Ripton's kind of one of those funny towns. When I was at Middlebury, you know, you didn't know what sort of clan was doing what was, what other sort of clan and customs no. and all that sort of stuff. No, that's okay. This is a Cowder River again, painting close to his neighborhood. He lived, as I said, in uh, Jamaica, and this is up the hill in South Windham. Uh, an early uh, um, uh, winter scene, uh, leaves are down, but there hasn't been a first snow yet. Uh, a very recognizable uh, location. This is Francis Colburn. He was the director of the art um, program, uh, actually founder and director of the art program at the University of Vermont. This is Barton. Uh, this is a beautiful little painting, long and skinny, very jewel-like tones, quite a pretty uh, painting. Uh, and um, uh, this is worth worth finding and worth looking at. Colburn was also an entertainer. He used to do these recordings where he had this great old Vermont accent and told these old Vermont stories, the kind that he said, the men would stop telling when the women came in the room. And you can Google him uh, on YouTube and you'll be able to listen to his actual voice uh, telling these great stories. And here we are again. used to buy his records when I was on the way down to the record store. And then college kids playing those uh, because they were so darn funny. And I was one of the few Vermonters in Norbury, so I had to sort of push my accent a bit up to Vermont. <laughs> Oh, there were, yeah. We can end the year, but this one if you want. What about the... That's way oxen. out. That's about 10 out. That's about I thought you already said there were only six. Oh, well, I just underestimated. Well, anyway, you, you know this. This is Harry Shopper. This is the brick house I grew up in. That's the theater. Uh, this theater, the old theater, the original theater. Well, we got to talk about it. Is everybody going to sleep? Can you give us five minutes? I don't know. This is John Atherton. Uh, there was a bunch of illustrators that lived in the uh, Arlington area, not just Norman Rockwell. They were all buddies of his anyway. And this is the old North Shaftesbury Railroad Station. And this was the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Just like the cover of the book uh, was the Saturday Evening Post illustration as well. Uh, and this is, I uh, hear you see, uh, the, these are all from the uh, 40s. And if you've ever been in the Norman Country Store, all of uh, that's the stove, isn't that stove? Same the stove. railroad stations used it, and all the country stores used those stoves as well. This is um, the painting that that woman was looking at at the very beginning of our slideshow, the way they were the steeples. This is uh, 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 going up on the mountain so that you can then turn around and ski back down. Uh, and uh, this is me, Schaefer, another one of the illustrators. A lot of these illustrators did not have the inventory of Saturday evening post covers at Rockwell. Uh, that Norman Rockwell had, but they still did dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Because don't forget, the magazine came out every week. Uh, this is quite and now, turn, told me one day that she got a letter or email from from Hugh Schaefer's grandson. Mm -hmm. And so I've been corresponding with his grandson, who was planning to come up and so on, so we can get some pictures of him with the painting and all that sort of thing. So. We march on. This is also a um, climber. This is the one we chose for the uh, cover of the book. We just saw it, that long vista. The Two Little Children was one of his trademarks. That is a lot of his uh, work. Had the two little children and the dog. 
This is two white oxygen way through by Kira Marco. This is a case where I just didn't want to put writing on the uh, uh, painting. I want you to enjoy it just without writing. And isn't this our closing painting? That's our closing painting. So, Kira Marco, the one we talked about, who, who um, lived in um, Halifax. Halifax, as in Vermont, and she painted this in 1959 as her parting shot at Vermont. In 1960, she moved to Haiti, not in Vermont. Jamaica in Vermont, Haiti, not in Vermont. And so, what is this? These are the diaphanous oxen, you know, being overtaken by the tracks of progress. And this was during the time when, and I have to get all artsy fartsy, but in this case, that's what it is. And Mount Snow was having this explosion of development down there, and the, uh, the Miami timeshare salesmen with the sunglasses were up selling, you know, they buy a mountain and carve it out on a piece of, you know, with rumors and so on, you know, you buy two acres, two acres, and they were selling stuff like that, and the towns had no, nothing, they had no laws to stop them or do anything to create any order, and so she's, this is what she's talking about, and it was then that several towns down around Mount Snow, Bill Schmidt being the leader of them, who um, also was the guy who revived the Gil Feather Turner, if anybody wants to know that building, she's a turnip cop. That's all the turnip cop. The Gil Feather So those towns, Bill Schmidt, they called up Governor Dean Davis, uh, who was a Republican, and said, help. No town in Vermont has ever done that. They, you know, who would invite the governor to come down from Mount Pedro? And you know, you don't know him around, but they need him. So they did, and Governor Davis came down, and he said, yeah, you guys have got a mess. And he, so that was the genesis for Act 250. He said, we'll help you, and it all started. Now, got, got kind of carried away with Act 250 over the years, but it saved Vermont, and as long as it doesn't be a ruination or we can't do anything, we'll be okay. So, Kira Marcus, thank you, and thank you all very much. So the month of August just finished, and as you know, we've been there, it's been very busy. And this year, the month of August was up 276%. Thank you so much.